I'm not really sure that Vincent needs an introduction because I think everybody here knows Vincent. Um, Vincent's, Vincent's the past president of the Historical Society. In fact, he was the president the year we acquired the, the Heritage Building at 808 South Baker. Um, of course, he's been here at the library as the research person for a long time. And, and, but recently, I saw where he was teaching a class at the college on Ozark history. And I thought, wow, if he could just come and give us a little snippet of what some of what he knows for our Historical Society meeting, how interesting that would be. So, here's Vincent. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to use a microphone because I figure you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to pull at least one shade down because we're going to be looking at some pictures and maps in a moment. There we go. All right. Dark and added. That looks good. Uh, thank you. Okay. So uh, I uh, recently did teach a class at ASU for adult continuing education. I taught on Ozarks history. I taught from 1803 to 1860, basically from the Louisiana Purchase all the way up to the Civil War. We parked at the Civil War, too much to get into there, but that's where I went through at. Um, I see some of my students here, so welcome back students. Um, I will have time right now to get into something that we didn't have. I briefly mentioned uh, for in class maybe for about 10 minutes, but now we have a chance just to deep dive into something around here, and I'm going to go into something called the Free Black Communities, or the Free Black Community Remnants of Northern Arkansas, which is uh, honestly, sometimes historically in Northern Arkansas, it is the elephant in the room. It is something that uh, we don't talk about. I think that should change. Um, pretty interesting what took place here. It was kind of sad how it ended. And so with all the flack going on in the media with racism and everything else, it is kind of a uh, topic that's not raised as much at historical conventions, um, especially if you're a white guy. And so here I am. I am very white with a farmer's tan. So I am pretty much redneck. So I'm going to dive into this. Um, so here we go. I'm going to go into, we're going to set historical context. So I'm going to try to bring you back into the context of when the uh, first free blacks came into Arkansas. And uh, we're going to discuss, first of all, what I tell my students. It's called presentism, and I'm going to get kind of technical here for about two minutes. But when you're in history class, um, and you watch, and you leave history class, and you're studying history, then you go watch the news. There are people that have issues and problems. Wow, we have a strobe light. We do. Yeah. 1970s. Wow. Uh, Crawford's coming in here, changing them all out here next week. So okay. So. Uh, there's something called presentism. That's when you actually take and you interpret the things of the past with the values, uh, the attitudes, the concepts, the experiences, and everything that you have today. We are going to judge everybody that lived 200 years ago or 100 years ago. Um, there is presentism that we can actually judge what presidents did 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, and we can judge them and criticize them by today's morals and standards because they shift so much and so I am going to ask you to take your presentism and take it right here and set it on a shelf for a while and try to just leave that to the side and then we're just going to dive in and take a look at what race relationships were like here in northern Arkansas and I believe we may be pleasantly surprised and then at the end we may be slightly disappointed too so here we go um, we we're going to talk about 1819. During 1819, we had a very important gentleman come here, 1818, 1819. We have Mr. Schoolcraft. He toured through here. He came through the Ozarks starting in November. He toured down through uh, southern Missouri, northern Arkansas, kind of wiggle wormed all the way through up towards Forsyth, Branson, Missouri. And he worked his way back down the White River to Batesville, Arkansas. Then by February, he was shooting back up to central Missouri. So that is 
1819 February. And so we have written record of what it looked like here. And so we kind of get a grasp of what's going on. All of a sudden, we have the, uh, he gives the context of what it may look here in the Ozarks when he comes up to a family um, over near the Bennett's Bayou. We might find, to his description, some people that are, that are not that civilized. And uh, they're really interested. Even the lady of the house is not interested in the finer things of life. She's interested in talking about killing bear, <laughs> a bear. So um, you work your way over to Oakland, Missouri, uh, Oakland, Arkansas, going up the white, up the White River into the north, the small North Fork up into Missouri. There is the Megaris, 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 Megaris. It can be pronounced three different ways. And there was a family who lived there. They were a little bit more refined and civilized there in Oakland, Arkansas. Uh, they had a scattered volume of some books there. And uh, so a little bit more civilization there. And so we have Schoolcraft giving historical context to this area. And so we do have Schoolcraft books. Here's my commercial. In the Arkansas section of, of the library, I do have the Journeys of Schoolcraft. Uh, one of the best books is called Rude pursuits one of the best books we have so so we're going to get into some context here <laughs> during this time while the the free black people lived here there were different laws being passed in the state of Arkansas this is one of the most significant laws here 1846 the statutes of Arkansas had legally defined mulatto and that's what our free black community will be termed as in, on the census rolls. They'll be mulatto, as anyone who had one grandparent who was Negro. And so that's what mulatto is. If you could have three white grandparents, if you have one, uh, you are not pure race white, and so therefore you are termed as mulatto. Free, Negro, free Negroes were categorized as black in the US, 50 cens uh, U.S. Census, as historians have adopted the term free black to refer to Negroes or mulattoes who were not enslaved. This is a very interesting concept. They are referred to as black. Marion County, they are not. I went through all the Marion County census records. I counted up 100 in 1850, 138 people listed, and none of them were referred to as black. They still kept the term mulatto, which is a softer term. So uh, this is what they taught me in school. Boom, this is the standard point. So I just thought, okay, I'll prove this in my lecture, just showing this. And, and uh, absolutely didn't happen here. Absolutely not. Other laws affecting free blacks. So if you're living here in Marion County, which I'm saying Marion County right now, which would be Marion and Baxter County. Okay, so they lived on both sides of the river. A lot of people may think it was just only on the Marion County side, since we're talking about Oakland. I have found them living all the way over towards Monkey Run. And so I'll show you some maps of that. Uh, free blacks, they still paid taxes. Yes. And who collected the taxes? Who's the tax collector? Does anyone know in the county? The sheriff was. Eh? The sheriff. Yeah. Absolutely. The sheriff would come and collect the taxes. And you could own property, not a problem. So during, the eight, during this time, let's say 1819, 1820, uh, you were going to go down to Batesville, Arkansas. You're going to go to the land office and you were going to purchase, get your land purchased there at Batesville. Uh, you're not eligible to vote though, being a free black. Uh, you're not free to testify against a white man in court under, the most, under most conditions. This is important in 1851 in Yeovil, Arkansas. Very important. So remember this. Some counties, black people could not own guns or dogs only, the, only with sheriff's permission, and they would have to have a signed receipt from the sheriff. Um, by 1850, there were 700 free blacks living in Arkansas. All the free blacks in 1850, by 1850, in Marion County, no receipt required. You towed it a gun, you shot it whenever you want to, you could carry it around, open carry, it did not matter. It did not matter. So, uh, 
if you're going to live as a free black, I would shuffle it over to Marion County, Arkansas. And where did most of these free blacks come from? The state of North Carolina and South Carolina. And interestingly enough, what county in South Carolina did many of them migrate from? Name, guess a county. Marion. 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 Marion County, South Carolina. <laughs> Correct. Good answer. Um, one of the one of the a good book to really to reference this would be this book right here. We carry it in the library. It's called A Stranger and Sojourner. Peter Collier, Collier, uh, Free Black Frontiersman in Antebellum, Arkansas, by Professor Billy Higgins. He's from Newton County. He's he grew up around Jasper, Arkansas, and he did the research over here and he wrote this book. Footnotes, actually the story's, the story's pretty good, the footnotes are the best. I have gone through, I have my own book and I have marked up my own footnotes, found out where he went and then started jumping off from where he had things at. So, really good footnotes. Uh, I will say, uh, on part of the story, he does have to use some kind to estimation or conjecture on how things, what he, what, uh, the families would do here and so you'll see sometimes he could have done this or he might have done this or he could have thought this when this took place but he is just basically setting the historical context for that and so it's uh, Dr. Higgins is one of the most sweet and personal men you'd ever meet really good guy and so there was a guy that he starts out here his name is Dave Hall Dave Hall was also referenced by uh, Silas Turnbow and his stories. There is a story um, called um, A Long Time Ago, and Silas Turnbow, come to think of it, I happen to have handy dandy little pamphlets here. And I happen to have Stranger and Sojourner book here, and then I have something that has Silas Turnbow's picture, and it says uh, the Turnbow Manuscripts by Silas Turnbow, and at the very bottom, if you look, it's kind of like print. I printed something in color on black and white on a black and white printer. But it has a web address to the Springfield Green County Library. At the library, on their website, they have all of Silas Turnbow's stories. And they are indexed. There are 28 volumes. They are keyword indexed also. You can type in a keyword. You can type in a family name. Absolutely great resource. 816 stories. I've printed them off, I've counted them, I've tried editing them to read them off auto in a, on an audio uh, CD. I've got a hundred stories down already. I thought it would just take a, a couple weeks to do a hundred stories. It took me about seven months. <laughs> okay. Turnbo, let me just say, Turnbo, when he writes a story, he does not know there is such a thing as a period or a comma. <laughs> so when you're going to read the story, you have to print it off. You look at it and you go, oh my goodness. Then you get out your red pen and you start making periods and commas because I have tried to read a whole sentence at a time. And some of these sentences are 12 to 15 lines long. And you're at the very end going, <gasps> and so that's, I've tried to edit a little bit here. So we have a guy named Dave Hall. He is the first man to show up here on the White River. And uh, his, Dave Hall, and this is what Turnbow said, is a colored man. Sally is his wife, uh, whose maiden name was Williams, was nearly white in color. So she is mixed race. I know nothing about their nationality, but the old settlers of the majority of them said that they were free Negroes. Dave Hall originated from North Carolina. From there, he went to Tennessee. And in Tennessee, he had a son. And then after there, he left. Not being satisfied there, he came to the White River in what is now Marion County, Arkansas, in 1819 and settled on the river bottom south side, some seven miles below the mouth of the Little Norfolk and three miles below where Joe Pace's Ferry is now. Now, where would that actually be? And I happen to have an old, old map. How about that? Okay. This right here is the Little Norfolk heading into Missouri. And this, if, if you follow this, you'll go all the way up. Today it's the lake, and you'll hit Pontiac, Missouri. Then you keep going on up, you'll hit Thedosha. This is the Little Norfolk. Norfolk, Arkansas, Liberty, that's the big North Fork. So you have the Little North Fork of the White River. That's what they would say. And over at Norfolk, it was... 
the big North Fork of the White River. And eventually we did not say around here the North Fork, we just, in, Ar in Arkansas or the Ozarks, we just say North Fork, okay? So that's how we have it here. Oh, too far, too far, here we go. So right here is the little North Fork, and you come right down here, and this is Joe Pace's Ferry. And so we are going to have to go three miles down. And if we go three miles down, we're going to come down right here. And then there is a mountain right here. And this is called Collier Mountain. Today, it is called Promised Land. This is Promised Land, Arkansas. <laughs> this is where the colony is at. This is where they first moved to. And then, get over here. Pace Ferry, and you're going to come down here, and you're going to start putting in fields. And you're going to have a big field here. And you're going to have a mountain here, and this is going to go on up. And on this side, this is Sister Creek. And so there are two Sister Creeks. And they are named because there were two sisters that David Hall had. I mean, he had two daughters. And these two daughters got married down here on the river. Therefore, there are two sisters, and each one lived by a creek. So they are Sister Creek. So there are two Sister Creeks, actually. Okay, so there's Trimble Flat. Oh, this is really interesting. When you start reading the uh, history records about this area, this is Bull Shoals Dam right here. This is Gaston's Visitor Center, oh, no. Bull Shoals Dam. And there's a place called, it's very treacherous for boats that get hung up. It's called the Narrows. We don't know about the Narrows, but it's right here. There is an island right here. Right here is an island, and that is the Narrows because there's a big island and gravel bar that people got snagged on. And so if you had a big load of cotton, and you're up in Oakland, Arkansas, and you had to put it on a flatboat, and you're going to come down, you're a little worried about the Narrows. The Narrows. And so that's the Narrows right there. That's a very important spot in the future, that whole spot right there. So you put that in the back of your mind. We're going to whip all the way around. Here's a Salt Peter Cave. This is Gaston's. And here's, oh, here's Gaston's. Here's where the airport strip is all at. So this is Gaston's. So I will show you our communities here. I got some other maps. So we're going to have a settler here, here, here. Here, 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 free blacks, here, here, Tommy. <laughs> that's, a, that's me. <laughs> yes. So uh, that was first settled by a free black. Two boys. Uh, one was Hall and one was a Turner. They both were soldiers in the War of 1812. And so that was where they settled out there. I have more maps here also to show you, but. So, uh, okay, this is Cotter, Arkansas. So, this is where McBee Landing is, and this is right where, boom, 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 boom. Okay, here's the creek. This is where the highway go, comes across right now, okay? This whole area here, here to here. Free black owned. Do, 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 swing it around. Okay, right here. This whole area right here. Free black owned. This whole area right here. Free black owned. They were all up and down the river. If you go on this side of the river, they were in Marion County right here also. So we ended up with about 30 big lots of families. And the families brought their other parts of their family from South Carolina. And so their families were growing and growing and growing. Dave Hall, so he had his wife named Sally Williams. Sometimes you'll see her referenced as Sadie. I'm like, what's he living with two women for? It's Sadie and Sally. So Sally Williams, uh, Williams is his wife and then he has a son, Willoughby, then Absalom, then David B. Jr., which you've got to watch out for these two David Halls. So Joseph 
James, Jim, whoops, that should only be one. James is sometimes called Jim, Leonard, Sarah, Mary, Margaret, Rachel, Harriet, and Judith. And then we have Eliza. Eliza is an important lady. She is one of the ladies for Sister Creek. She is one of the sisters. So, What's, what's so big about Dave Hall? <laughs> He's the first to bring a whiskey still. He is the first one to bring a whiskey still. This is, this is documented four different places that he has a whiskey still. And so it's a really good thing to do because if you have corn and, there are, and you start looking on the census that you may have 500 bushels of corn and three blacks would have up to 500 bushels of corn, you cannot eat all that corn. What are you going to do with that corn? You're going to distill it and you're going to make corn liquor, and then you're going to use that as a commodity to trade. You're not going to drink much of it. You're going to trade it. That is taking your corn, distilling it down, and it is worth the value of money. Okay? The one thing when they would come and tax you, the sheriff would come and make an assessment, he would look for your bushels of corn. Well, I only have 50 bushels of corn for the whole winter. I don't have much corn. So you cannot tax me much. And so they wouldn't get taxed. They would take their corn liquor, they would distill it, and then they would hide it in the woods. <laughs> and not, they would not be, so they would miss that revenue. That's where you get the revenuers from, okay? They're not being taxed. This is one of the best things. Let's just turn it all into that way. Um, Dave Hall and his sons apparently ended up being preachers, Baptist preachers. <laughs> So I have family in Tennessee. Their last name is Lynn. You ever hear of Loretta Lynn? Mm -hmm. Same family. Uh, his name was Absalom, and then there was another one, Caleb. They were they were uh, they were um, primitive Baptist preachers, which today we would say Church of Christ. They they were known to distill corn, and so they, here we have these primitive Baptist preachers making corn whiskey because it's the best thing to trade and barter with. It was money. And so take that corn, turn it into money. Um, to get up and down the river, to get the still up and down the river, you would actually use a flat boat. This is what an 1831 flat boat would look like. You could put cattle in there. You would put your sheep in there. Oh boy, wouldn't that be fun? Uh, and you would go up and down the river. And that's what a flat boat would look like. This is a a replica of a flat boat for Abraham Lincoln. This is at uh, New Salem up in Springfield, Illinois. It's a good replica. This is a flat boat here. This is, this is probably more typical for the White River because of all the narrows and the shallows. And if you're going to transport your whiskey, you need something narrow to shoot through the gaps with all the snags. This may be a little bit more what you would what you uh, do commercially up and down the river, back and forth, back and forth. That first one, would people live on it, or is it just transportation? People would live in them. That's what I thought you were yeah. meaning. They got nasty. Oh. Yes? How would they get on the upriver? Uh, they would do two things. They would take poles, and they would pole it just like a keel boat, or they would take a rope on the very front of it. Oh, let's go back here. They would tie a rope right here, and then they would have a block and tackle, and then they have a rope. Block and tackle was kind of expensive, so they would just get up to a tree, and sometimes they would just get and put their back into it up on the bank, and they would drag it. That's called cordelling. They would cordell the boat up the river. Hard work. Uh, what they would do a lot of times up and down the White River, if you had produce, you would put your stuff in a flat boat. You would take it all the way down to New Orleans, you would sell the lumber. They would take the lumber and build shotgun houses. You would get the money and you would find another way back up the river because you're not dragging that thing from New Orleans back up here. I will sell the lumber to you. So you, know, you put your livestock in there, you put your, your cargo, your cotton, whatever it is, you go down the river, then you sell your flat boat. Yes, sir. How far north were the steamboats able to come? The steamboats could actually come to Buffalo Shoals at this time. 1848, a steamboat actually made it to Forsyth, Missouri. 1848. Three miles before it made to Fort, 
before it made to Forsyth, uh, they lost both stacks off of the steamboat and they had to repair it because the White River was over, you had trees overshadowing all the way up and so they had guys all the time up on front of the steamboat, up on the top, they were always cutting limbs. And the Corps of Engineers, that was their main job up and down the river, is to cut a path for the steamboats to go up and down on. And so, yeah, that's a pretty tough job. How many men would it take to, to navigate one of the large <coughs> boats there? Well, you need at least two. One to stay awake <laughs> and one to do the boat. Okay. Most likely, it was a family affair, and many times you had at least five or six men. But there are there are stories of guys going, I know the river well, I, I'm going to Batesville, and I'm selling my lumber down there, and I'll walk back. I'm going to Batesville, I've got this cotton, I've got to sell. Cotton was really important. Cotton, um, so let's just talk about cotton really quick. For a half, for a whole acre, you would get about 250 pounds of cotton. Okay, 250 pounds. So you had to have two acres to get a bale of cotton. And that's about what they produced up here. A, ha a whole acre, a half a bale of cotton. Compared to central Arkansas, that's not much. South Arkansas, it's, it's, it's poor, it's poor fare. Okay, so, uh, and you're going, and you're going to sell that for, and you're going to make about $50 a bale. Okay. An average man should make about a dollar a day, and you're going to maybe make a bale in the Ozarks. North, let's say north of Batesville, that's when it gets hard. And so you're going to make 50. If you can pull off, if you can have enough family to do two acres, three acres, and four acres, uh, Dave Hall had five acres. He was a wealthy man. He had five acres. I mean, that's, that's pretty good stuff. Here's one more. If you're going to take your cattle upstream, this is what it would look like. Okay. Just Jacob Mooney came up here also in 1820 in a keelboat or a flatboat like that. Apparently with his hogs and some cows. It's not an easy thing to do. So we have our keelboat. So here we have a keelboat landing at Bell Point. Take a look at the picture. And over here on the picture, this is a painting here, and you will see an African-American soldier right here. So we had eight soldiers that helped found Bell Point or Fort Smith, Arkansas, coming on a keelboat, and they were with a guy named Major Stephen Long. 1817, Fort Smith was founded. It was a big thing. Those... Out of the eight guys, seven of those men ended up on the White River up here. And this right here is our man, David, uh, Peter Collier. Peter Collier. And so here we go. The U.S. Army listed Collier, Calder, who was African descent, as a colored man. Now this is 18, 1812 when he enlisted. So how did he get in, involved in 1812? The British came in. He and his dad Moses were free black. They went, and after the British were kicked out, they needed somebody to guard Washington, D.C., and he was part of the uh, third U.S. Army 3rd Rifleman. After that took place, um, he actually went and trained in Pennsylvania, and he became something called a crack rifleman. He was a sharpshooter. One shot, that's what they were training, and he could do it. He was good enough that uh, Major Stephen Long asked to bring him along on this, on this journey down here. And Stephen Long, because of Stephen Long, we have on the White River, there's a place called Long Creek over in Marion County, uh, not Marion, uh, Madison County. You ever hear of Madison County? Mm -hmm. You'll go towards Fayetteville, you'll see a place that says Long Creek. It's named after Major Long. And so they surveyed that whole area up through there. Another term we have is called Melungeons. Melungeons were associated in the Cumberland Gap. That's around where my family came from. The simple, central Appalachia, East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, Eastern Kentucky. 
They were known as tri-racial populations thought to be of mixed European, African, and Native American ancestry. The two senators from New York in 1860 to 1865 called Abraham Lincoln, Abraham the Africanus. By his facial features, they swore that he was a Melungeon, and they hated him with a passion. They hated him with a passion. And so they thought, and you'll see articles every so often in the New York Times about Abraham the Melungeon because of his facial features, his ears, uh, how his chin was drawn out. And so they thought he was part ape. He was mixed race. And so. And so he actually, there's a picture of him there. He actually is the one who ended up in Marion County, Arkansas. And if you look at number 47, 47, 47, 47. Mm -hmm. Should see Peter Collier up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there he is. Doo, doo, doo. So these are his records from 1812 when he signed up. And we're working our way through. Uh, after, uh, after serving five years, he did another stint for six years. All of a sudden, how are you going to pay these guys? You don't have the money really to pay these guys. They got free land. And so the land that they were going to give these soldiers was in Arkansas. Because they were going to, these soldiers were going to be the buffer between the white people and the Indians. These are crack soldiers. They're sharpshooters. When, they, when the Indians come back and forth and they have a war, these soldiers were going to be living on the land. And they gave him land in Fulton County, Arkansas. He came and looked at it. It was mostly rock. It was barren. It couldn't produce. And he turned around and left it and went back to the army and said, I need another job. Sign me up for another six years. And they signed him up for another six years. Being a free black, he was a private. He will never get a promotion. So you have all these other guys who are basically idiots coming in as privates and ended up going to be your captain and your sergeant, you get fed up with it. Uh, here's his land. i got to show you this really quick. <coughs> There's his name. Oh, in Sharp County. I said, did I say Sharp or Fulton? <laughs> okay, it's Sharp County. It's called a script warrant, Act of 1812. This is your payment for coming in and helping defend Washington, D.C. and serving six years. <coughs> After two years, all of a sudden, we got to 1827, Peter kind of got fed up with all the things happening around him. What did he do? You see this little word right here? Deserted. Deserted. He deserted. He made connections, and he had family connections, and he made friends with other free blacks and sympathetic white families all the way from Fort Smith up to Oakland. He, got on a, he had a guy that supplied him a horse, another guy who was, was a free black, he got on a horse and he worked his way up on a horse and he hid sometimes and then he just kept going up all the way to Oakland, Arkansas. He deserted. So at that time, when he was coming up here, this is Indian Territory, this is Ozark County, this is Douglas County, Missouri, Gainesville, <coughs> right here's Gainesville, here's Ava, here's Forsyth, this is Shawnee Territory. Okay. This is Delaware Territory. Delaware Indians were given this. <coughs> this is Kickapoo Territory. We come to Arkansas. We have Cherokee Territory. And there's a little section right here that no one's here. And so they are going to start stacking these soldiers from here to here as a buffer to protect everyone. Kind of. It didn't work. We had wars. Basic. We had basically six pretty violent acts of war break out between the Indians, and they were killing each other. And it was really bad. From 1806 to 1827, it was. There's a lot of newspaper articles, a lot of massacres, Indians against Indians. And so, take another look right here. The blue is Cherokee territory. Cherokees had formed alliance with the Shawnee, so Yellville was Shawnee town, and a group of Shawnees lived there. Down, also down near Sillimore. Also, there was another group of Kickapoos that made alliance uh, with the Cherokee, and also the Shawnee and the Kickapoo were down at Sillimore, and sometimes that's called Sillimore bo uh, Kickapoo Bottoms down there. So let's get back here to where we were at. 
This is Trimble Flats. This is Amos, Arkansas. This is a map from 1909, actually. This is before the dam went in. This is one of the best maps I play with so many times. So, Amos, this right here is a really important because this is where a guy actually lives, and his last name is Hall, and he is a free black. This is one of the first homesteads. Uh, this is where actually a birthing room. This is where Eliza lived, one of the ladies, and she was a midwife, and she helped a lot of other ladies give birth. And so this was a place where a lot of guys and girls were born at, right here on the little point of Amos, Arkansas. This is Bull Shoals Lake. If you look at Google Earth and the satellite, you see this portion right here? That's Dave Hall's farm. Can you see that light area right there? Mm -hmm. I'll do it right here. Here it is. That's Dave Hall's farm. And we're coming down here to Lakeview. Everyone look at this right here. See this little right here in the, in the boat dock here? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? The core calls this a duck foot. You see this duck foot? <laughs> this duck foot, it's important. It's very important. And so here again is Dave Hall's land. This is Brown's Beach. Everyone knows Brown's Beach? You ever been to Brown's Beach? I got a great end. I got baptized here. Right off Brown's Beach. Right across from Brown's Beach is Promised Land area. So that's, that's a very important area. We're going back down here, right about where the, at the very point, that is where the dam is going to be, and we're going to work our way back up. And this area right here is going to be the duck's foot. Okay? That's going to be your duck's foot. There is an improvement here, and this is a survey taken in 1848, and so we have a good plot of land here. You use land for planting, it's precious. If you're going to dig up anything else or plant something that's dead or whatever, or bury something that's dead or someone that's dead, you are not going to bury them in your good field. You're going to go up, up the hill, up the ridge. You do not bury people on a bottom unless it's rocky or it's not useful, most likely. You see the duck's foot again? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, keep that in your mind. We're going to go right here, 1827 census. It was Izzard County, Arkansas, okay? Izzard County became, this was Izzard County. It was Lawrence County, 1825 were Izzard County. 1836, we become Marion County. So Izzard County, we're looking at all the free blacks right here in 27. How many males? Can you read that? 15. 15. Nine. 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 Nine females, 1827. So, wow. that is our small population beginning in 27. And we're working our way on through, and then they start having kids. And they have family coming in from South Carolina. During that time, newspapers are growing up. This is the Batesville News. And also, the weekly Arkansas Gazette comes out. And what do they see? they see these things right here. These are runaway slave notices. Hmm. This is Batesville stuff. So this, all this is all up and down the White River. This is the news for the White River. When I first started working with this, this kind of made me uncomfortable, honestly. So, yeah. Dark yellow complexion? Um, there's acts being passed. This is 1843. This is an act to amend this prohibit the immigration and settlement of free Negroes or free persons of color into this state. Approved January 20th, 1843. So the problem is we have, we are no longer allowing immigration to come in if you're free black. They want to whittle down the population. William Woodruff, the number one publisher of the Gazette, um, I have issues with him. I go to the graveyard where he's buried at, and I look at him sometimes and shake my head. 
He's buried, he's buried at Mount Holly Cemetery in Little Rock, Arkansas. But he would drum up a lot of strife in Little Rock with his editorials. And uh, he would push and push to get these acts passed. And so historically, I look at this right here, and I think of William Woodruff of the Gazette. Personal opinion. I'm trying to keep my presentism out of it. <laughs> but you read some of his editorials. I will not read them today, but yeah. North Arkansas Times. This is out of Batesville, Arkansas. Looks what, look what's advertised. Can you see that? It's the sale of a what? A ferry in a tavern here. Tavern or store. So tavern today, we may think of taverns just a place you go drink. A tavern is a place where you get something to drink and you're going to sleep. And you're going to cram about five or six people on the bed. And remember, we don't take baths for about three or four months at the most, okay? And you're right by the White River. Please, please jump in. So, uh, <laughs> so Towards Ferry is well known throughout the state. It is where the road crosses and you can, have to, you can get across. If the river is up, so we had some major floods, okay, major floods, 1826, horrible, 36, 1826, 36, 41, 45, 47, 1862 was just disaster all over the place. 1862 during the Civil War, it was horrible. So you could, sometimes you could go across the river with, with your wagon and your horses, swim it or just pull it across, it was dry enough. But those years, forget it. You needed a ferry. And it was on the military road, which we may also call the Trail of Tears. Okay? I would love, I'll, one of these times I'm going to talk about, the, I'd like to tell about the Trail of Tears and the trail through here. And so, here's the 1850 census. Well, how about that? Peter and his wife, Eliza, are prolific. They're having quite a few children. So at the very top it says farmer, then it just says ditto, ditto. So he has another guy named David. Eliza's dad's name is David Hall. Their firstborn son they named David. And look right here. This is 1850. It does not say black. It's M. Mulatto. Huh. How about that? So he was 55 and she was 34? 30. 36, 34, oh, 30. something like that, yeah. That's about right. Wow. That's about right, yeah. She got married when she was kind of old. Okay. The records say she was 14. Wow. 12, you're engaged. Okay. 12, a lot of times in that era, 12, you knew who you were going to marry. 14, there was one reference that she was get she was starting to get older uh, in her engagement. So 14 years old. You got an 18 year old daughter. And here are the 1850 censuses again. And it's mulatto. You can't really it's well it's tiny up here. One, two, three, it's mulatto. Okay. We're gonna go back to Talbert's Ferry. Here's what's interesting. Talbert's Ferry, we have people going back and forth. We have the community here. By 1850, we have three, we have over 300 people that are free black living up and down the White River in this whole area. Some people call it a colony. There are only 700 people in Arkansas that are free black, and we have up to that many right there. So it's growing. September 1851. 1851. A trip from Batesville, Arkansas. There is a guy named James Hall. Sometimes he is referenced as Jim. So when you see James, you got to look him up. Is this the same one as Jim? James Hall. He comes up from Batesville, Arkansas, 1851. I think I know why he came, went to Batesville, Arkansas. During August of that year, the last of August, he is in Batesville, Arkansas, and he just got a land grant. And so he is coming back, and he's walking back, and he's at Talbert's Ferry. Something happens, and a little heart, tart, terse words are passed back and forth with another guy named John H. Tolbert, or Talbert. The newspapers say Tolbert, at Tolbert's Ferry. They get in a scuffle. Something happens, and James Hall, a free black, 
kills John Tolbert. Mm -hmm. John Tolbert was a black or a white or a white? John Tolbert is white. white. And he works at the ferry. And he's in Marion County, Arkansas. And the court house is where? Yellville. So they have a trial. Well, there's nothing listed that, he, that uh, James Hall does not go to jail. He's just put on bond and he waits around. This happens in September. So we're waiting around and all of a sudden, the next, in 1851, see, in September 1851, this actually, he comes out and there is a trial. Whoops, I don't want you to read everything yet. A trial <laughs> takes place. Now remember, can anyone who's African American mulatto, can they testify on his behalf? No. No. Who are the people who testify? What color are they? White. They're white. Wow. The jury. Guess who all the jury are? White. They're white, and they're in Yellville, Arkansas. And guess what? He's acquitted. Not guilty. The prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney, interestingly enough, are brothers. <laughs> they're brothers. Um, actually, James Hall and his dad, Dave Dave, David Hall, with the attorney and the judge, have had business relationships and they've purchased land from each other, too. It almost seems like a, play, a, a level playing field, except by state law, a mulatto, African American, free black, cannot testify, but he is not guilty. What's that all about? And so here we go. James Hall, a free Negro, was acquitted a few days since by the circuit court in Marion County of the murder of John H. Tolbert in September 1851. This is in March of the next year. Counsel for the state, John Byers, assisted by James P. Spring, Esquire, James A. Wilson, and William Bryan, Esquires. Oh, so we, there we go. We have the Byers. They're brothers. They're brothers, and actually, they do. They actually done business with both of the halls, so that's just kind of interesting. This is the only trial in state history that actually happens this way, and a, and a mulatto, free black, is not guilty, and it happens in Marion County, Arkansas. It just blows me away. Yeah, mm -hmm. blows me away. But there's a seed of contention sown right there. Okay, and so. Um, Silas Turnbow, remember when I talked about this right here, which you guys need to get these, mm -hmm. there is a story there called Dodging Bullets. And so the story is pretty interesting that this story takes place again uh, during, I believe it, during the Civil War. And here we go. I'm going to read a portion of it really quick. Oh, here we, we can do this. In giving the story about Jim Hall, who was the brother of Willoughby Hall? Somebody. One day in 1856, Jim Hall killed John Tolbert at Tolbert's Ferry on the White River, 10 miles east of Yellville, Arkansas. John Tolbert was the son of Simeon Tolbert. When the war broke out, the Civil War broke out, Jim Hall was living on Gooley Springs Creek just over the line in Missouri. You guys know where Gooley Springs is at? Up near Thin Ocean. It's a good place to grab suckers. It's a good place to go fishing. Gooley Springs. You remember Gooley Springs, Dad? So that's where he's at, up Gooley Springs. Um, one day during the war, some of Mr. Tolbert's friends, uh -oh. oh, they remembered him and captured the murderer, and they had taken him to foot to one of the three brothers that is down now in Baxter County, Arkansas. So all of a sudden, he's up near Thid Ocean, Missouri. They're chasing him, and they chase him down to one of the three brothers. You know what I'm talking about? The three brothers, the three, the three mountains. Three brothers, Arkansas. So that's why we call it three brothers, because of three, three mountains there. The intention of the men was put him to death for the shooting of the man, Tolbert. The man, Hall, was a stout, robust, and active, and just before he was compelled to stand up before a firing line, he made up his mind with strong effect and effort to dodge the bullets. And when the men cock their guns and aim at him, he would jump, roll, tumble, whirl about as fast as he could, escape the aims of the guns, 
and the bullets that would inflict only slight wounds. Remember, they're, they're loading one bullet at yeah. a time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Finally, he would become greatly exhausted in strength <laughs> and repeating this every so often so they keep reloading and shooting at him. <laughs> he became greatly no. exhausted in strength. So this guy's getting shot. <laughs> and repeating this so often, he resorted to another ruse to deceive his enemies by falling on his face as if he had been shot dead and they believed he was dead. But after his enemies stood around him for a few seconds, one of the men concluded to take, make a test and see if life was really extinct, and he picked up a small stone and struck him a light blow on the head with it. He believed if there was life in him, he would flinch from the effects of the rock, but Hall never moved. Hall heard the man remark about the stone, and he knew it would be death if he did move, and he nerved himself to bear the peck on the head from the man that gave him the rock. They all agreed now that he was dead, and they pronounced him dead for certainty, and went off and left the supposed dead man lying on his face as where he had fell. Okay, you want to hear the rest of the story? <laughs> they had thought... They had no thought of giving him bur bur burial. They for rather would have the wolves come and devour his body. But the man was more alive than dead. And when he was satisfied that his enemies were entirely gone, he raised his head up, looked about him, and finding that no one was around in sight, he rose up on his hands and feet to test the soreness of his wounds and found they were only flesh wounds and not very deep ones. He began to creep slowly along over the rough ground until he reached a place of concealment that lay there until after night when he made his way to Sister Creek. So he's at three brothers, and so he's getting his way from three brothers over to Promised Land, over Sister Creek. There's a, like a Sister Creek Resort. You guys know where that's at? Just look up Sister Creek Resort and you'll find Sister Creek, Promised Land. He traveled down the stream through the darkness of the night until he reached the river fence, the river of his father's old farm where he had seen on the following day using and he was seen well he, this is such a long sentence and Jim was seen the following day using his tongue pretty lively he was telling people about it he got away from them he was dodging bullets so uh, there you go um, I'm going to keep going on this is the big thing that affected everyone that was here um, an act to remove the free Negroes and mulattoes from the state. It's called Act 151 of 1859. This is it. This is the one that did it. Sometimes it's called the Arkansas Free ne Negro Expulsion Act of 59. It was signed into law February 12, 1859. It basically gave them a little over 11 months, 10, 10 months or so, 11 months, not quite 11 months, but anyway, it gave them time to get all their belongings and skadoodle out of Arkansas. So where did they go? They went to West Plains, Ark. They went to West. They went across the state line, Ozark County, Missouri, and went over to West Plains. Some of them stayed around in the West Plains area. Some went over towards South Central, and then over towards the Boot Hill near Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And some of the families are still there. And reading and researching on them, some of the families, most of the families. They're not mulatto. They're not black at all. Some of the families, when this research took place, didn't realize their history that they had of their background. Uh, there is, I, I don't have, I didn't, not going to get into it really quick, but actually, they, he carried, one of the guys carried papers, and he went to the courthouse in Yaleville, and the paper actually said in 1839, I am not African American, I am not of African descent. I am Portuguese, and my my mother is white. She was white and Indian, I believe. Dave Halls was. She was white and Indian, but he said I was Portuguese, and I have just a good tan. And a lot of them would pass pretty close because they go not Spanish. There's no accent, but they have the dark brown skin. They're Portuguese. They and had so, no idea what Portuguese sounded like. Yes, and so what happened when he went to West Plains, Missouri, he had the recorder. He took that paper to the courthouse. He said, I am not African descent. I'm Portuguese. Look at my paper. 
at the courthouse in Yellville. They documented it. I want you to document it in your record books. And they did. And they did. Uh, there's my governor that did it, Mr. Conway. And he's buried down at Mount Holly Cemetery with all the other people down there that made history in Arkansas. This is his tombstone. So. Yes. Before you get too far away from the beginning, and I should have asked this, what was the deal about the dogs? What was the matter with the dogs? What, why they couldn't have dogs? Yeah. Um, dogs could hunt, number one, but dogs could, you could sick a dog after, uh, after a white guy. It was protection. Um, you could not have, you couldn't, they even passed a law in 43 that if you were even a free black, you could not have a dram shop which a liquor store. You could not sell liquor. You could not work on a steamboat as a free black because Mr. Woodruff, the Gazette, drummed up a lot of stuff saying the free blacks here are taking away labor from Take the, jobs. They're taking the jobs out of Little Rock. And if you were free black in Little Rock, bless your heart, you need to leave. They had a hard time. And so what happened, Arkansas got rid of them. And all of a sudden, when they got rid of them, some of these counties realized how much money and revenue was coming in from the free blacks. And they're going to their state reps and going, you've got to change this. What are you doing? We've lost revenue. But it was too late. 1863, they passed the law and said, okay, you can come back. Yeah. We're in the Civil War. Are you kidding me? I'm coming back to Arkansas? Please come back to your land. They were losing revenue. They were losing revenue, and that was another editorial um, that was going on. <laughs> and so here's some of the newspapers. The Act to Remove Free Negroes. This is the very front page. The mulattoes from the state. January 1st, 1860. You better skadoodle. <clears throat> so we're going to come back here. I want to show you really quick, this is Cotter, Arkansas, and you're coming across the bridge. This whole area right here was owned by a John Hall. Hmm. So when you go across the bridge and you look to the left and you, and you see the creek right there and you're going up the hill to, the over, to that overlook up there and you're overlooking Cotter, uh -huh. that point where that overlook at, that is the corner of his, that's, the corner of his land comes right there, and so you're overlooking a whole spread that was settled by free blacks. Wow. Yes, sir? Does Hall Mountain have anything to do with that? With that In Marion County? In Marion County, that is a different hall. Okay. Yeah, that's <coughs> down, the one on the Kirby Creek area? The um, Ford Rush, in that area. Yes, that's, that's a different Hall family, and yes, that Hall family, they were not mulatto, they were white. Completely different family. Okay, now for the new stuff. Here's Bull Shows Lake. There's my duck foot. Again, here we go. We're coming down to the duck foot. Improvement. There was a guy named John Turner. He was the son-in-law of Dave Hall. He owned land. Okay. All this section right here. Then up there to the river and this part right here. A guy named Alan Trimble owned this land right here. A guy named by the last name of McNeil owned this land right here. His name was James McNeil. He's my fourth great grandfather. The duck foot, and this is the Corps of Engineers picture of when they were looking at all the cemeteries to dig up all the cemeteries and transplant them before they flooded the lake. There was two cemeteries. One says Ritter Cemetery. See the Ritter? Mm -hmm. And it's right before you hit the dam. Right before. And then you go up just a little bit and this is the edge. And this part right here is the duck's foot. And this is a little knoll right here of land that sticks up. And there is a dirt road that actually goes here. They didn't dig it up. Oh, because it was Negro. They didn't think it would flood. Oh. 
They didn't think it would flood. So Jeff, if you went there today with your guys to mow that, <laughs> I was there two weeks ago in that general area, kinda, I think I know where it's at, you would need hip boots. <laughs> But that's where it's at. And so I talked to the Corps of Engineers years ago and just confirmed, confirmed, confirmed all over and kept saying, no, no, no. They, they didn't transplant them. They didn't. There's no record of, the, there's records of them identifying as a free Negro cemetery, but there's no record of them transplanting them because no, no fault against them. They thought it would be hot, you know, the lake would never get that high. But I will tell you, when the lake gets really high and they have to open up the floodgates, it's coming pretty close. And I think, I'm not for sure, because I've gone out there and looked around. I'm just lost as a goose out there on the duck foot. Because there's not a tombstone out there. There's just an area, you know. And so what did they have back then? They didn't have tombstones. They had field stones. And... Silas Turnbow has a story called Long, A Long Time Ago. He actually said, on this land, Joe Hall was born and is where Dave Hall and his wife died and both are buried, lie buried here. The body of Dave Hall was the first interment in the graveyard there. Wow. And I've narrowed it down to that one. Uh, if you read this, he says it's promised land. They did not move. They were going to move that to Promised Land Cemetery, but they didn't move it. And I got an email. I have a person who is a relative. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you They're doing everything remote control. They just finished over there and they turned everything. Chatty. That's okay. We just got to the good part. I kept going, what did I do? Okay, I just have a few more slides. Well, takes, that's, that's got to cool down before It takes 90 seconds on. to cool, doesn't it? It's okay. Okay, so Dave Hall moved off the White River, where Oakland's at, and he moved on closer into Baxter County. And he moved to a lot that says it's at, on Section 9 and Section 10, in this township, and it's where? It's right here, everyone. See? It's Pilgrim's <laughs> Rest and Monkey Run. Oh. And that is the land that he purchased and cleared in 1851. And he has another allotment there in 1857. And so that's where he was at. And so it was always about, they were always on the White River, and they, most of them were in Marion County. Well, it was all Marion County at one time, but I'm finding more. There's, there's just as many in Baxter County now as there was in Marion County. And so there's an equal share there going. Plus, oh man, there's this really slide. So I'm going through the 1827 survey of Baxter County at that time. Well, now it's Marion County, but it's now Baxter County. And I'm looking between the line of Section 9 and Section 10, and all of a sudden there's a notation. Can you see? I wish you could see this notation. It says, and it's the creek that passes right by there by the church where that little bridge is there before you go up the hill, right there at that bridge, it says, in the creek, on the, let's see, in the creek where the line between section 9 and 10 crosses, it was found a lump of lead approximately weighing near one pound. And it was good lead. Now, Turnbow says that Dave Hall, in his later life, was actually taking lead and he was melting it down and he had plenty of ammunition. And I'll be honest with you, I had a hard time with that. But yesterday I was going through and I happened to bring the map up one more time and I kept seeing these scribblings, I kept blowing it up, blowing it up. Boy, I wish you could see it. <laughs> anyway, it's there and all of a sudden I'm like, what is that notation? I worked and I focused it and I, I developed it again because I mean they wrote in ink in 1820, 
eight, but they, they found a pound of lead, a lump of lead. And so could Dave Hall be a guy that could actually supply ammunition to the people in the area? Yes, because there is actually lead mines down through there, isn't there, Sonny? And that line that he has works its way down towards Monkey Run, and another guy that he has, uh, another of his son-in-laws, are down on Bruce Creek, and he was pulling up lead too. And so, you also, your family, Judy's family had some fa uh, a mine down there too. Used to call it the Big John Mine. The Big John Mine, and so they were finding lumps of it. On this survey, they were just finding good lumps of it around, and so. Is it possible to supply lead? Yes. Uh, across the river, up on the bluffs in Marion County, there's the Saltpeter Cave. Um, that right there, apparently, <laughs> I went there in 2014 and climbed in the cave, had fun with it, and had another friend. It was exhausting. I'll never climb in there again because you're not supposed to go in there without repelling equipment. We got out, because I'm here. Um, but it was exhausting. I got in there and my friend said, wow, what happens if there was a, would be a panther or a bear in here? And I'm down in this, in this lead mine having a good time. And I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm going back in Turnbow and they killed a couple panthers and a bear in that lead mine. Oh. And, uh, and they were also in there, they were also pulling out saltpeter to make ammunition in the same place. So they were pulling out lead and saltpeter from the same cave. And so, <laughs> thank you, Chatty. Yes, sir. Uh, I remember getting lead out of the cracks in the, I believe it was a road going up to the tower. I, I couldn't hear you, I'm so sorry. Uh, you remember what? I remember getting lead chunks out of the, the cracks in the rocks that goes up to the tower. Oh, the really? Hmm. Well, I've still got some of that. Which tower? The watch tower? The tower up there? Observation tower. Observation tower? Well, Mike Rover owns that land now. The last thing, last thing I want to say, there is a tombstone in Little Rock for Peter Collier. He died in 1860. It's waiting for a signal from your computer there. Yeah, there's a, one more button that they have to push. Okay. I don't think we're going to get it. And so, <laughs> here's the tombstone. Oh! Oh! Yay! Wow. Hey, look here. Da -da -da -da. Line section between nine and ten crosses. It has found a lump of lead. Mineral. 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 Weighing, weighing nearly a pound. Nearly a pound. Yes. Nearly a pound. Wow. And that is right there. Boom. And it comes up here. And then they found another one sample right here, too. And so they were finding lead up and down that creek right there. And we'll skip on here. Okay, basically this whole section was for free black uh, plant, where free blacks own all this. Tommy, you live down here. So you can actually recognize that. Um, and the last thing I want to show you, there is a war monument down in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it has all the soldiers who fought in the War of 1812. And... Uh, Two years ago, they went out there and they engraved Peter Collier's name on that monument. And so you can go down there and take a look at it. Uh, it's, it's on the Capitol grounds. You start driving around, you'll see the big thing with the big column with the ball on it. That's it. And that's actually Dr. Higgins right there giving a, a speech on it. Um, in Little Rock, Arkansas, you will actually, see, you can go to Mount Holly Cemetery and see that. That is Memorial Stone buried there. We do not know where he was buried at. This is 1861 when he passed away. Somewhere probably in Missouri. 
have no idea where he is buried at. He did pass away in 1861. He was born in 1795. So uh, he was with South Carolina Militia. And there's the monument. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah.